And testing, testing, three, two, one. Let's see if we are alive. Yeah, so it looks like I am back and looks like I'm streaming again. Hello, Just Janice. Uh, please do drop a one in the chat to let me know that my audio is coming through clearly, but there are no issues. And uh, yeah, sorry about the technical glitch that has taken me so long to fix. So welcome everyone. Good to see you all again. Philip, Spider1132, Sergeant Grinch, uh, Tom, good to see you all. D. Muellerman. All right, I am back. So let's just dive in where we left off. Roseanne, good to see you. All right, so it is really intriguing that, that I've had um, these, these three videos that discussed my discussion on Luther. I, I thought there was somewhat lacking in actual Luther content going to the actual sources and verifying if I'm just inventing my own facts. Uh, so, yeah, so uh, that was Anthony Rogers' response that because God killed the, killed the world with a flood, it's okay for Martin Luther in context to suggest that a disabled boy should be killed because he's not fully human. Um, makes perfect sense. I'm sure that's, that's normal Christian morality. Harold Johnson, good to see you. Okay, now, of course, Anthony Rogers did also say, he says, it's like the quote, which is usually attributed to Luther, but it's actually John Calvin who said it, that we're saved by faith alone. So he says this in the video. It's in the, if you go to my community section, I have that up, and the link to the actual section in the video is there. <clears throat> so now John Calvin was eight years old when Luther supposedly nailed his thesis to the church door eight years old. Now, I personally suspect that John Calvin was doing very little theology at that point in his life. I could be wrong, but, but this is my personal suspicion. Now, in Luther's works, I did a search, and these terms appear as follows. Justification by faith alone. There were 21 results in 18 articles. Justification by faith, there were 79 results in 61 articles. The words by faith alone, 164 results in 137 of Luther's articles and saved by faith alone, four results in four articles. So <clears throat> now Calvin apparently wrote this in his in his Institutes of the Calvinist Religion in 15, 1647 or something, was it? 1547. And Martin Luther, I found references to Martin Luther using that term as early as something like 1530. So <laughs> that's interesting, Sergeant Grinch. Yeah. So um, yeah, I I'm gonna have to take this particular statement under advisement. Yep, so now with that out the way, let us dive into the meat of the topic that I want to get into today. So Anthony Rogers is like a broken clock. He's only right twice a day, says Sergeant Grinch. Yeah, so, um, okay. Now, I've been watching quite a bit of Martin Luther apologetics in 75. Welcome back, just Janice. So, I've been watching quite a bit of Martin Luther apologetics. Now, of course, there's a certain tone to the apologetics. They have to minimize certain issues. They have to steer away from certain facts. They've got to avoid certain things. So now Martin Luther has written numerous books and articles, very deeply hate-filled articles, the statements of which are actually very common in polemics against Jews today. They're, they're used by Muslims. They're used by atheists. They're used by Christians. I have seen numerous, numerous quote-unquote Christians, like on Thaddeus' channel, there was a guy that was constantly making claims, and these claims can be directly traced to Martin Luther. Right, we're going to have a look at some of these today. The reason I'm selecting this paper by, by Professor Isaac Kalimi is that it, it, it's a synthesis of all of Luther's work. So it's not just focusing on one work, but it's a really, it seems to be a fairly balanced work that focuses on a number of different areas of Martin Luther, and it specifically addresses a very common defense of Martin Luther, where people say, Oh, Martin Luther's hatred of Jews was theological, not, not on a nationalistic or racialistic basis. So therefore, he wasn't an anti-Semite. He was just upset with them on a theological level. And he addresses this and he calls, well, he says that's not true. Let's look into that. <clears throat> Calvin said that you were predestined to say that. Yes, Sergeant Grinch, you were predestined. There's nothing you could do about it. 
So, The Position of Martin Luther Towards Jews and Judaism, Historical, Social, and Theological Avenues by Professor Isaac Kalimi. Please look in the description box. I've got this linked. You're welcome to download it from my archive. Check it for yourself. So, he goes here, right? A reading of the works of Martin Luther reflects inconsistency in his approach towards Jews. On the one hand, in the early stages of, of his career as a Protestant reformer, Luther explicitly condemned the church's history of oppressing Jews and calling for a constructive engagement with them. Right, the so-called Judeophilia or Judenfreundlichkeit, Jew friendliness. More dominant, especially but not exclusively, in the later stage of his career, Luther made several poisoned assertions and accusations against the Jews as a collective and penned three violent anti-Semitic manifestos with many false allegations. That's Luther's, Luther's Judenfeindlichkeit, or Juden, his Jewphobia, or his enemy phase against Jews. <clears throat> so, uh, 1278 says, Lloyd, would you say that Protestantism spread the same way as Islam? War, birthright colonies, bringing in true faith to the heathens? Look, there's a little bit of truth in that. Um, war doubled, apparently, after the Martin Luther period. The, I discussed that already, so if you go to my discussion, let me go to my channel. Just bring this up. Let's try not to get off topic, if you don't mind. I, I'd like to keep this on topic so that I get through the so that I get through the material. <clears throat> you go to the live. If you go here, the story of the first Protestant, right? This one here. Lucifer, the story of Martin Luther, the first Protestant. I discussed that, so please have a look there. Don't make me repeat all of it here now. All right. So they see, he says, is this attitude towards Jews? Like he, on the one day, he had a very positive attitude and the other day, a very negative attitude towards Jews. Is this a coincidence? What is the story here? So he says, Luther published his relatively friendly work that Jesus Christ was born a Jew. Now, here is where Luther apologists will constantly say, well, you know, Luther said very nice things, you know? So if you look at Luther said very, very sweet things about the Jews and we really need to remember him for that. So the part where Luther said we should kill all the Jews, we should murder them and burn their synagogues and, and destroy all their books and possessions and throw them out of the country, we need to forget that. So, yeah. <clears throat> yeah, so this is the part. So we're going to have a look at the not-so-nice things today. Right, the other side of the polemic that, that is kind of overlooked, probably just by accident. So in this, he overlooks typical charges against the Jews. For example, the Jews killing God's son ritual murder and he criticizes the brutal christian oppression of them and called for their integration in christian society now let me go up here and make sure i didn't miss anything okay so something very interesting that you might find interesting you can find his cv is here right um not sure if you guys can see this very well but this is his cv it is really really so this is isaac kalimi cv and then another interesting book that you might find, it's, it leans towards being very favorable of Luther, but it has some interesting comments about interesting discussion of the actual history, Martin Luther's anti-Semitism against his better judgment. I'll just bring that up for reference so that we actually have the information for you to go look up where you can read a little bit about this. So, so that's the book, Martin Luther's anti-Semitism against his better judgment, Eric W. Gritch. Have a look at that when you have a moment to so just read through the comments. Okay, now let's continue here. So, he does say here, Although the term anti-Semitism was coined later in 1879 by F. Wilhelm A. Marr, the phenomenon existed a long time before. The use of the term anti-Semite or anti-Semitic regarding Luther's approach towards Jews is not an anachronism. Luther's hatred was not only on biblical theological bases, but also based on race, ethnicity. His descriptions of Jews as a collective bloodthirsty nation or as an ethnic group of liars are definitively or definitely not in the category of biblical theological, but rather race ethnical. Now, for instance, he mentions here Luther's letter to his wife dated February 1st, 1546, stated that his dizziness might be because he had passed by a Jewish area. So he felt sick because he uh, walked past a Jewish area. He attributed metaphysical power to Jews who wished to harm non-Jews and also took them as scapegoats for his personal problems as an anti-Semite does. Okay, well, fine. Um, good Christian behavior, I guess. I, I don't want to accuse a guy who 
calls people liars and says that they make people sick by juju is anti-Semitic and we don't want to do that. That's Christian behavior. That's normal. Luther was a was the good guy. <clears throat> okay. So let me see. Then in Commons Wikipedia, there's a there's a letter or Wikimedia, there's a letter by Luther to one of his pastors where he insults a contemporary former and insults Jews in a very bad way. Oh no, he goes all the way in. So so Jude, he believed Jews had magical powers against the Gentiles, pretty much. So now he says, was there never a genuine change, right? In Luther's view of Jews and Judaism during his entire career or even lifetime, I mean, was he sincere when he was being nice to Jews, when he wrote this nice little book, you know, this book about Jesus Christ was born a Jew, and where he did not accuse them of killing God's son or of ritual murder or drinking blood or things of that nature. So he says, but was Martin Luther sincere or was he using that as a tactic, which would be a political tactic? This would simply be for a reason, an agenda. So he was not honest in his approach. So he says, was it just a tactical approach in the earlier stage of his career for a limited time when he took advantage of the horrible situation of the Jews in order to achieve religious, political, and some other goals as well? Luther's antipathy towards Jews and his abhorrence of Judaism were overriding through the course of his entire life, and it never genuinely changed, certainly not regarding Judaism, or as he called it, rabbinical Talmudic Judaism. His performance and conduct reflect two sides of one and the same coin in order to achieve his goals. He used a friendly method for a short time, attempting to accomplish a specific purpose with the Jews. But when he failed, he attempted to achieve the same purpose in an unfriendly and harsh method, even harsher than that of any pope in church history. Now, here's where everyone's going to go, <clears throat> well, you know, the popes did it as well, you know. Um, okay, so let me see. Guy murders guy, and then he goes, well, you can't accuse me because cause there's a guy in the on the other block who also killed someone, so... So why are you accusing me of this? Um, the judge would immediately let you free because, because yeah, how can you charge someone with a vicious crime because someone else a week before, three blocks down the street, had also done it? That That's innocence right there. But also the Pope is not the founder of the religion. The Pope is the manager of the store. And if the manager is stealing from the store, that's bad, but it doesn't mean the store is evil. Whereas Martin Luther is the founder of the religion. Martin Luther is the rock and the pillar and the, you know, the progenitor, etc., etc., of the Protestant religion. <clears throat> so he says, the aim is to engage with the wide range of Luther's works. And that's one of the reasons I chose this paper. He actually goes through a number of sources. So I thought this is a really nice collection that he goes through that highlights a lot of Luther's works. So I don't have to read three of Luther's books. I can, this will tell you where to go to find more details. So he engages with Luther's works and sources from his time, including some rarely explored Jewish responses to Luther to shed light on his approach towards Jews. Okay, so Luther wanted to reform or to solve what later on in modern times was called the Jewish question or the Judenfrage. In one way or another, his temporary Judeophilia was a chain in his overall reformation and was just one side of the coin and it did not stem from his humanistic, moral and ethical values, but from his intended religious, political, and social, and perhaps also financial agenda. Well, if he can convert the Jews, they will fund him, he'll have some money, and he can go and fight the Pope. So he wished to take advantage of the miserable situation in which the Jews stayed. So these were miserable people, these were oppressed people, badly treated. And he wanted to convert them to Christianity and thus to erase the Jewish question in Judaism once and for all. Right. <clears throat> so he adopted, so when his friendly approach didn't work out, right, he adopted an even more extreme Judeophobic and anti-Semitic approach. So in order to pressure the Jews as much as possible and bring them to their very end. Now, he adopted a polite, kind approach to the Jews for a short period saying, oh my God, those nasty Catholics, that evil Pope, look what they've done to the Jews. I'm not like that. I'm Martin Luther. I am better. My name is Martin Luther, and I approve this message, but not those not those evil popes. No, 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 those Catholics are evil, and I'm, I'm a better man. And then 10 minutes later, when the Jews weren't like falling at his feet trying to convert, he's like, you know, we need to kill these guys, all of them. We, we need to burn their houses down. We need to murder them. That's a good idea, I think. 
So yeah, Martin Luther in that way was much better than the popes, much better than the, the Catholics, because 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 Martin Luther came to improve things. Um, by the way, I should let you know I'm going to be using what's called the historical sarcastic method to do the analysis here. So, <clears throat> so, so the Jews must either give up their false and heretical Judaism, accept Jesus as Messiah, and convert, or simply perish and disappear as society gets rid of them. He threatened them basically. Now, a range of key factors for Luther's Judeophobia being his dominant attitude all along. So we're going to present a range of key factors that he hated Jews, and this was always his attitude. This was, when he was even when he was being nice to them, that was a temporary tactic, but he hated them all along. And he had his obsessiveness to achieve this goal, and his goal was cross or expulsion. Accept Christianity, sorry, sorry, accept Islam, or we will expel you from the land, agony and death. So either you will accept Islam, or we will kill you, or expel you from the land for your fitna. So this was Martin Luther's position. Sorry, maybe I should turn this to green. Give me one second. I think it's a good idea. Why green? Because that's the color of Islam. And when I, when things are sort of Islamic, that's only appropriate. Okay, so this approach, in fact, has never been offered before in the scholarship. Because obviously everyone is like pro Martin Luther. Bro sounds like Hitler 2.0 literally. Yes, I've covered this already. So yeah, look at my my oh, Hitler thing with Luther a couple of weeks ago. Okay. So Crusader General says, imagine being a member of a church to find out later that the founder is a Satan worshiper. Well, yeah, we're gonna have to look into Martin a bit closer. So yeah. Sounds like Hitler and Armenia Al Hussein, exactly, Maria. So let's have a look here. So this article argues that Luther's Judeophobia is rooted in his interpretation of the Bible. So Luther's fears of Jewish magics and the persuasive power and influence of Judaism and Hebraism that may harm Christianity just added to this. And also he had a practical church political agenda. Remember, we've already discussed at length over several episodes how Martin Luther had a political agenda and Martin Luther was twisting and utilizing theology in the service of the princes. He was a tool he was using and writing propaganda at the behest of the princes. He was corrupting theology at the service of the German state, which Lutheran theologians did in the 19th and 20th centuries too. Ariel Johnson, drive safely. You'll be listening, I hope. <coughs> Welcome, Jen Carlo, pianist. Welcome. Okay, so this agenda was another side of his rebellion against the Pope. So this article offers many fresh insights. It also suggests a fresh and comprehensive analysis of several sources that challenge common assumptions of church historians and theologians, right? And it, in contrast to the latter, which have been stated especially in Germany in light of the horrors of 20th century history. So yeah, Luther has a lot to do with 20th century German history. It questions some scholars' efforts to explain Luther's anti-Semitic assertions and manifestos as part of the norms of his contemporary 16th century European Christian society, as if he was just a son of his time. Like, for instance, if Luther had married a nine-year-old or married a six-year-old and slept with her when she was nine, this is where Protestant apologists would have to come in and say, but he was just a man of his time. This was normal for that period. It was normal for Muhammad to marry a six-year-old and have sex with a nine-year-old because that was normal. He was just a son of his time. He was a man of his time. So therefore, Martin Luther was a man of his time. The Catholics were evil. Martin Luther was better. Martin Luther rescued Christianity from the evil Catholics, and he was just a man of his time. He was better than everyone else. He was just a man of his time. That hypocrisy. <laughs> yeah, so. Now, Luther never accepted or respected Jews and Judaism as they are. In many cases, Luther acted as a politician rather than as a responsible theologian and religious leader who attempts to advance morality, ethics, humanism, and brotherhood. Interesting. So the Augustinian monk, who in 1517, so you can see he had, not even this historian, and I've, I've presented several so far in the last few weeks, that discuss Martin Luther's political agenda. Definitely not a man of his time. Well, you see, the thing is, if he's a man of his, look, for instance, we could say then using the same argument, well, Jesus was just a man of his time. I mean, he said, love thy neighbor. But that was, that's that's so 2,000 years ago. You know, that's so 2,000 years ago. 
He says, do not steal, do not lie. That That's just so 2,000 years ago. I think what we should do is we should consider, reconsider morality in the light of modern needs. And I need more money because, because. <clears throat> and so I'm just going to start robbing and thieving. And this is, you know, because Jesus was a man of his time, that was just lessons for that time. And we need to, we need to move on into the modern era. See? So, so Martin Luther was just interpreting Christianity as, you know, as, a, as, the, as the new Christianity. Of uh, That argument doesn't hold water. That is hypocrisy. That is relativism. That is subjectivism. Yes, exactly, Philip. Ends justify the means. That is not Christian. That is purely self-serving interest. So, no, that is not Christian. That is not living with eternal principles that are always moral and always right. So, he wanted to reform the church, and he came to be immersed in hatred. Now, they say he wanted to reform the church. Now, Barack Obama transformed America. <clears throat> yeah, he reformed America too. So, yeah, hope and change, right? Now, really, to so for instance, we also hear that he wanted to get rid of indulgences. To get rid of indulgences, he had to kill all the Jews, remove 30% of the Old Testament, remove... I don't know, 20% of the New Testament and edit some of the verses of the Bible because that's how you fix financial problems in indulgences by editing the Bible and killing all the Jews, I, I guess. I, I, I'm, I'm, a, I'm just a guy from Africa. What do I know about theology? Martin Luther knows best. So he came to be immersed in hatred and vigorous violence that was first directed towards Pope Leo X personally as well as towards the papal institution as such and then towards an invalid children. Now, we'll discuss that at length. There's a lot going on there. I'll discuss that particular where Martin Luther says that, an, that a child who is handicapped should be killed. Yes, he did say that. Now, and then he expressed his violence towards German peasants. We'll talk about that. And also towards Turks and all Muslims, okay? And particularly the heretical Jews as a whole, whenever and wherever they were. So, and he was also a believer in superstitions, right? And Luther's anti-Jewish writings were a source of inspiration for the German Nazis. And he was a great inspiration for the Nazis, a point that has already been admitted in the scholarship. And I've covered that at length. Luther was and still is the role model for many followers of the Protestant church's attitude towards Judaism. And I will say that is 100% true. I have seen it over and over and over. I was mentioning on Thaddeus' channel, there were people that were constantly spouting exactly the things that we're going to hear that Martin Luther would say. And these are Christians, being Christians, apparently. So, <clears throat> Luther's position towards Jews and his Judeophilia. Luther's motivation to engage with Jews. So this is the positive phase. Luther's religion, sorry, Luther's religious reformation in the German territories that began in 1517 took place 25 years after the expulsion of the Jews from Spain. About 20 years after their forced conversion and expulsion from Portugal, in 1497, and only 11 years after the newly converted Jews of Lisbon were condemned as being heretics, slaughtered and burned in April 1506. The German Jews were aware of these tragic events that befell their brothers and sisters in the Iberian Peninsula, while they were struggling for their own enormous religious, social and economic difficulties that put their existence in question. In 1492, 27 Jews were burned alive at the gate of the city of Stanberg, or Mecklenburg. In 1499, the Jews of Nuremberg were expelled from the city. In 1510, the Jewish community of Brandenburg was blamed for the crime of blood libel, which caused the burning of 38 Jews. I will state this, and I have a book on the topic, which I was going to cover in the future. I wanted to do it many years ago, in fact. Um, the Christian church has blood on its hands. Christians have done evil, and... These are reprehensible crimes that were committed, and we need to be honest about this history. We need to know about it, because those who are ignorant of history will repeat it. <clears throat> There's the expulsion of the Jews of Regensburg in 1519, and the expulsion of Jews from Rottenburg of der Tauber a year later. So Georg Herzog of Bavaria was the Bishop of Speyer, and he ordered the isolation of Jews in his diocese, because they are not humans, but dogs. So there's loads of this information that goes around. It was permissible to, bapt to baptize Jewish children against the will of their parents. You could kidnap the children and baptize them forcibly. Luther himself, okay, so in his work that Christ was born a Jew, 1523, Luther testified that popes treat the Jews as if they were dogs and not as human beings. 
They forbid them to work among the Christians and to have social interaction with them. That Christ was born a Jew, he shows that Jesus and Jews are actually from the same root, and he calls the Jews brothers of our Lord. And he describes the intolerable treatment of Jews by Christians. The way our fools, the papists, the bishops, the sophists, and the monks, the big assheads have before now dealt with the Jews, a good Christian might actually have become a Jew. If I had been a Jew and I had seen such mugs and blockheads rule... Now, do understand, many of these translations are very polite translations. Martin Luther was not averse to using the most foul language. I think we've already discussed that. The last two episodes, I've discussed Martin Luther's extremely foul language. Martin Luther... Actually, there's a quote in, in his works where he says, And if anyone opposes me, I will use vile, foul language to silence them, to shut them up. He knew it. Okay? But he was a man of his time, which which means Christians at that time would, would be using incredibly foul language because that's what Christians did then. Today we might not, but, but it might come back into fashion because it's the time. Because, you know, Jesus, it's just an accident that at that time Jesus was using, wasn't using F-bombs in the New Testament. It's just a... Just coincidence. Just coincidence. Martin Luther is the is the example that tells us this. So, if I'd been a Jew and I'd seen such mugs and blockheads rule and teach, so often these translations are very polite. Understand, the original might not be so polite. And teach the Christian faith. I should rather have turned into a pig than become a Christian. They treat the Jews as if they were dogs and not human beings. <clears throat> so Luther goes on to suggest treating the Jews in the same manner as any Christian. I would advise and beg everyone to deal kindly with the Jews and to instruct them in the scriptures. In such cases, we could expect them to come over to us. So yeah, okay. And he mentions here the supposed killing of the Christian boy Simon of Trent, okay, Italian Simonino di Trento in Tyrol, Italy by a Jew in 1475, resulted in the death of eight Jews and the burnings of Jews in Dagendorf and in Sternberg. And these are illustrated as woodcuts by Michael Wolgemuth in Hartmann Schedel's Schedelsche Weltchronik. So, Chronicle of the World. Okay, Schedel's Chronicle of the World, a historical thing. Right, and you can see there are detailed discussions on Isaac Kalimi, Martin Luther, the Jews, and Esther. Biblical interpretation in the shadow of Judeophobia. He's written other works on this topic. So, yeah, we could expect them, but because we've mistreated them, we've treated them like dogs. Jews are more likely to convert to become pigs than to become Christians, because look how we've treated them. We can't do this. If, however, we use brute force and slander them, saying that they need the blood of Christians to get rid of the stench of their stink as Jews, and we treat them like dogs, what good can we expect from them? So this is Martin Luther saying, oh, those popes are bad, ooh, those Catholics, ooh, Harold, bad, bad guys, you bad Catholics here. And I'm better, my name is Martin Luther, and I'm better than those Catholics. And he says, we must deal with the Jews not according to the law of the Pope, but according to the law of Christian charity. We're going to see how this hypocrite goes in exactly the opposite direction and completely reverses position. Yes, Luther, party mouth. <clears throat> so let's see. Uh, is there any kind of the end? Yeah, I had to start over because I had a technical, major technical glitch. So let's see. Uh, Mike Simal says, sorry for the question to Lloyd. Was it Luther who convinced the King of Spain to expel the Jews and the King of Portugal? At the time, he followed orders from Spain and did the same. I don't know. I, I do not know. Um... So, so Luther's condemnation and fresh suggestion were a shining star in the darkest night for German Jews. Okay, so they really thought they have a friend in Martin Luther, and of course, Martin Luther eventually abandoned them. He turned on them. He betrayed them. So the heretical Jews were labeled through centuries as the killers of God's Son, killers of the prophets, and other innocent divine messages, messengers, and they steadily refused to accept Jesus as Messiah. Right? They interpreted the scriptures differently, and they even challenged the church Christological and allegorical interpretation. So he says, so where did Luther get his, his view, and what was his basis for that? Right? What was his motivation? And he says, Luther's new initiative most likely stemmed, first and foremost, from his ultimate political program. Political, mm, again, and his religious goals. He wanted to take advantage of the desperate Jews and attempt to attract them to his newly reformed church, and in acting friendly towards them to increase further the polemic against the Roman church. So let me see. What does it say in the Quran? You should act friendly to the Kufar while you conceal the hatred in your heart. 
Hold on, heck, this has to turn green because, yeah, a little bit too Muslim for my taste, but I could be wrong here. What do you think as an audience? This is hypocrisy. So we're going to have a look at this because we're going to see that this this is, this is gets really deep here. This guy goes really good, and, well, really deep into it. And you'll see Martin Luther's hypocrisy at an early age. The, it's not like he was when he was young, he was good. And when he was older, he got crotchety. And no, no, no. It's actually consistent. So Luther took a new direction toward the old and unsolved Jewish question in Christian society in order to achieve the goal that all the popes failed to achieve over hundreds of years by oppression and cruelty, namely associating the people of Jesus with the religion of Jesus. So Luther blamed the Kölner theologians who wanted to convert the Jews by violence and slander, but God resists them. Okay, so those nasty, nasty Catholics. So Luther simply took advantage of the historical reality of his time, place, and circumstances. When the hopeless and helpless Jews were struggling for their survival in the muddy social situation of the German territories and Europe, in order to cause them to give up their ancient ancestral religious and cultural heritage and join Christianity. <clears throat> so, the key approach of Christianity to Jews is well summarized in the Epistle to the Romans. Israel's rejection is not final. It is compared to a tree. If the root is holy, then the branches also are holy. So, interestingly, if the Jewish root is unholy, then the branches, and we are the branches, we are unholy as Christians. But if the root is holy, then the branches are holy. And if the branches are holy, the root is holy. So, indeed, as regarded by the gospel, they, Israelites, Jews, are enemies of God for your Gentile sake. That's St. Paul, sadly. But as regarded by election, they are beloved for the sake of their ancestors. Romans 11, 16, and 28. So, I believe this is St. Paul telling us, that that Jews are enemies of God for your Gentile sake. Now, whether he meant it as enemies, as in these are enemies you need to go and kill, I thought we have to love our neighbor, love your enemies, right? Even Jesus said, you know, forgive them, they know not what they do and so on. We'll get into that another time. But he says, look, they are beloved, right? For the sake of their ancestors. And they brought us the religion. Remember, salvation is of the Jews. But of course, a typical Protestant approach to is to do proof texting. I like this verse. I'll ignore every other verse. I'll ignore all of history, but just the Bible. I'll just take that one verse. I like it. And that's what my worldview is now based on. That's what my theology is now based on. Okay, let's continue. So Christianity considers Judaism as the rival religion, which is developed from the common sacred text, the Hebrew Bible, the Old Testament, and tirelessly struggles against it and its bearers, the Jews. It adopted the rejection replacement theology that considers Christians the true Israel, Vare Israel, Israel in the spirit, Israel nach dem Geist, and the continuity of the biblical Israel. All right, Christians are holding the religion of spirit and the true religion and are following Jesus and are therefore gloriously flourishing while the Talmudic Jews are just Israel in the flesh. Israel nach dem Fleisch. <clears throat> the biological descendants and heretical ones were keeping the religion of laws and the false religion. It's interesting because that's exactly what Muslims call Christianity and even Judaism, the false religion, the Deen al Batal. Always interesting. And they deny Jesus Christ and they even put him to death. Now that's the standard polemic. So, <clears throat> therefore they were re rejected and afflicted by God and the temple and Jerusalem were destroyed. So, the curses in Psalm 109 were interpreted three times by Luther in a Christological method as the curses of Jesus upon on Judas Iscariot, on all Jews, and on Judaism. So mercy and a respective reconciliation will only be given to them through conversion to Christ. So, there's a curse by Jesus, according to Martin Luther, on all Jews. So, the awful situation of the Jews had a double function. A divine punishment of the Jews' sin and kept their stubbornness, and refused to accept Christ, and as a warning to Christians about what would happen to them if they would betray the religion. Now, let's briefly go to the correct interpretation of the Hebrew Bible, or the Old Testament. Erasmus of Rotterdam and Marcion of Sinope, he is, a, is the very first... Well, no. Marcion of Sinope was a major, major enemy of the Christian Church, of the Catholic Church in the day. So, he obviously created his own religion. He was a Gnostic heretic, and the reason that we have a canon of the Bible is because he created his own 11-book canon. 
and he didn't like the Old Testament and some of the New Testament, so he compiled his own canon. The church was forced to then create a canon specifically to counter this guy who had a lot of influence. So Erasmus of Rotterdam and Marcin of Sinope were ready to exclude the whole Old Testament from the Christian scriptures. Luther stresses the importance of it for the Christian theology. Well, yes and no, we'll discuss. He considered the New Testament to be older than the Old Testament since it was promised from the beginning of the world. Okay, fine. According to Luther, because the Jews rejected Christ, they lost the key to understand, interpret, and translate the Old Testament. For Protestant reformers such as Luther and Calvin, who moved the Bible and its interpretation to the center of Christian belief, and presented it as the ultimate authority in the Christian life while challenging the Pope's sole authority to interpret it, Jewish biblical interpretation could undermine their Christian theologians' authority. So therefore he had to deny that the Jews had any knowledge of and any right to do interpretation of the Bible. Luther never tires of showing his deep animosity, his hatred, towards rabbis and of warning those in his audience who read them to do it with criticism. He violently criticizes the Jewish interpretation of the Bible and considers it a falsification of God's word as Jewish blindness and as a conglomerate of lies and he rejects it absolutely, calling the Jews the perverters of holy scripture. So he violently criticizes the Jewish interpretation of the Bible. So yeah, I wonder where that comes from because I've seen some Christians have really similar views to Martin Luther. Now, these faults and unknown Jews and Israelites, who have interpreted no writings of the prophets. So he says, these are false Jews. These are false Israelites. Now, I have seen, you get the the the, the fake Hebrew Israelite, Israelite movement. I've seen so many Christians, so many Muslims. Those aren't atheists, but Christians, supposed Christians. Say, those are not real Jews. Those are not because they're repeating the words of Martin Luther, the arch anti-Semite, because that's the Christian thing to do, because Martin Luther was their example, whether they know it or not. And so no Jews have interpreted the writings of the prophet. I, I believe that the, the Bible is kind of comes from the Jews. I could be mistaken, but okay, thanks, Martin. And the Jews have perverted everything. Welcome, Lil Main. And they have done nothing in the open, but underhandedly and clandestinely, secretly. Like children of darkness, children of the devil, they have practiced nothing but blasphemy, cursing, murder, and lies against the true Jews and Israel, which is the Christians. That is against the apostles and the prophets, and they continue this daily, and thereby they prove that they are not Israel or Abraham's children, but venomous and devilish foes of the Christians, right, of the true Israel and Abraham's children, and in addition, the spoilers, robbers, and perverters of the Holy Scripture. That's Christian. I'm 100% convinced. Martin is just talking to me here. I can just, I can feel it. So it behooves us to recover scripture from them as from public thieves, wherever grammar warrants this and harmonizes with the New Testament. So yeah, guys, what are you getting from this so far? But I'm getting a feeling that he doesn't like the Jews. So now Martin Luther was reckless in his language. I think we've covered so far in the last three weeks or so, two weeks, Martin Luther as a majorly influential theologian, was incredibly reckless with his language. He did not consider how people are going to listen and apply his words. So when people say, well, the Nazis, that's on them for misapplying Martin Luther's words. No, the, the Nazis did not misapply. They understood correctly and applied correctly. And Martin Luther left the door wide open for that particular interpretation. So they blaspheme our faith so poisonously right so yeah and remember he wrote on the jews and their lives so he was trying to say something there i'm sure <coughs> i'm still pretty sick so forgive me uh, martin boucher yeah we'll talk about him and uh, how he and martin luther and uh, and and melanchthon all permitted bigamy you know for a man to marry multiple wives which has nothing to do with islam it's got, it's, that's the Christian thing to do. <clears throat> it would be appropriate, this is, a, this is a colleague of Martin Luther's, it would be appropriate to expel the Jews totally from the Christian state. 
However, if it is decided to tolerate them, the following conditions have to be laid down. Jews will have to swear not to curse the Christians and follow only the teaching of the Torah and the prophets and not those perverse fabrications of the Talmud. Now, everyone accuses me of defending the Talmud. No, I just don't want these Protestants to lie about the Talmud because they do. I'm not necessarily defending it. I'm simply saying, look, you need to be honest about it, not continually lie about it. <clears throat> Erwin Schouten says, I brought some of this up with Protestant family members recently. We're ethnically Jewish. It certainly caused a stir. I, I can believe it, yeah. So, until Luther's time, ecclesiastical interpretation demanded scriptura et traditio, which means studying the scripture and the tradition of the church together. So, prior to the advent of Martin Luther and his wacky Gnostic ideas, it was normal, historical, since the beginning, to study scripture and tradition. In other words, history. Look at the history of the church and, of course, have the teaching authority of the church because the church is the ground and pillar of the truth. Not the Bible, the church is. The church came before the Bible. Tradition created the church, the church created tradition, and then the church created the Bible, much later. So Don Cain says, the more I learn about Luther, the Islamic parallels are staggering. Yes, namely how the history has been immensely doctored. Yes, it's been immensely doctored. Yes, I'll be doing a lot of Luther. We're going to be talking a great deal, and we're going to be seeing a lot of that. So he says, Luther insisted on interpreting scripture, the New as well as the Old Testament, alone and in its own right. Sola Scriptura, okay? So he insisted, now I'm going to show you something here. I'm going to do, um, um, ah, good grief. I need to find a reference that, um, 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 um. No, sorry, give me a sec. I just got to find it. Okay. <clears throat> okay. Now notice, I'm going to show you this. Luther, Martin Luther misrepresented the Bible. I know we have the claim of, I know I make very bold claims. Hopefully I can back up my claims with evidence. Evidence that you yourselves can check. All the references are there for you as well. Martin Luther deliberately distorted the Bible, knowingly doing so. So he condoned and he practiced relativist, subjectivist biblical interpretation. In his document called The Freedom of a Christian, he states, furthermore, I acknowledge no fixed rules for the interpretation of the Word of God. I acknowledge no rules, no fixed rules for the interpretation of the Word of God, since the Word of God, which teaches freedom in all other matters, must not be bound. He then quotes 2 Timothy 2.9. Now this is Paul writing from prison. Wherein I suffered trouble as an evildoer, even unto bonds or even unto captivity right? Even unto being captured in chains. But the word of God is not bound. Now, not to get into, because I will discuss this at length in the future, but Paul is saying, I am in chains. I am captive. I am bound. But the word of God is not bound. The word of God is free. It's out there. It is spreading, right? People are learning it. I am in prison, but the, but the gospel, the message is not in prison. Martin Luther deliberately interprets this verse in a way that promotes personal freedom in interpretation. He misrepresents, deliberately and willfully misrepresents scripture. This man is a liar. Okay. Now, again, Thaddeus made three videos responding to me and apparently I make, he disputes my factual information. Um, fine. But um, yeah, you let me know if, if I am known to be, let's call it counterfactual. So, please let me know. You're adults out there. Some of you are far more educated than I am. You have been to university. You've got your masters, your PhDs. I'm a knuckle dragger from Africa who dropped out of university. So, please let me know if I am misreading this. So, does this verse say that you are free to interpret the Bible in your own personal, private manner? Or does it say that, that while I am captive... Yeah, Roseanne Rossi, I'm a hairdresser. Yeah, but the, yeah, you're not as dumb as Martin Luther, that's for sure, because this man has an IQ of a freaking potato. So here, I acknowledge no fixed rules for the interpretation of the Word of God, because the Word of God must not be bound. 
So in other words, I can make up anything I like. I can interpret this any way I like. This man is a child. <clears throat> I did not educate myself into imbecility, says Roseanne. Very good point. That's crystal clear. Easy to see the twisting from Luther. A blind man could see it. Yeah, classic Bible gotcha. Yes, Deno Dennis. Yes, so I hope you understand. Giancarlo Pierna says, you are not wrong. So yeah, hopefully you can understand. Martin Luther, I have called him a liar. I have called him a vile, disgusting, dishonest sophist. But man, I mean, you don't dislike Martin Luther enough. However much you think you should detest him, you clearly don't detest him enough. Because the more I dig, the worse it gets. <clears throat> yeah. Even you can understand that he was not a good man. So yeah, I'm going to skip this for the moment. So hopefully that makes my point. So that's Sola Scriptura. I will make up whatever bloody interpretation I want to suit my personal whim. Now, the word Talmud is here used as an inclusive name for the rabbinic literature and interpretation as a whole, right? So the Bible can mean whatever one feels like at the time. Correct, Dr. Jonathan Gemmel. I trust that the, my interpretation is not false. Hopefully that makes logical and rational sense to you as well. So when people are saying Martin Luther didn't mean this, Martin Luther apologists from theologians with PhDs to people preaching to 5,000 people at some mega church, they are lying. Now, whether they realize it or not, but those are not true statements. They are severely in error. And that's the word of Martin Luther. Okay. Okay, let's continue. The place of the Jewish question in Luther's worldview and reformation. So the place of Jews in Judaism in Luther's life, thinking and writing, cannot be overestimated. He published no less than five extended works regarding Jews and about 200 table talks known as Tishreden. So the table talks, Tishreden, okay, you would know them as Hadiths. Okay, let's, yeah, you really want to think of them as Hadiths. So these are the companions of Martin Luther, wrote a lot of Hadiths about Martin Luther. Just just think of them in those terms and you won't be wrong, okay? If you get my meaning, right? The Hadiths of Martin Luther. And of course, I am routinely told, but Lloyd, those are weak Hadiths. Those are weak Hadiths. Okay, sounds familiar. Sounds kind of familiar. So he wrote 200 table talks that deal somehow with Jews and Judaism. He also made numerous assertions about them in his sermons, theological texts, biblical commentaries, he did the same about the Pope because he hated the Pope. On Psalms, Malachi, and official and private letters. Thus, okay, <clears throat> converting the Jews was not just another trivial issue in Luther's worldview, but a fundamental issue. Okay, let's continue. Now, uh, he says here, there would be no more Jewish cursing of the Christians and blaspheming and defamation, defamation of Jesus Christ and the Virgin Mary, something Luther repeatedly blamed the Jews for. I hope that if the Jews are treated kindly, he says, and are instructed neatly through the Bible, many of them will become real Christians and come back to the ancestral faith of the prophets and patriarchs. So, the Jewish question is part of the struggle with Rome. Luther had another implicit religious political motivation to convert the Jews, namely to unite all German speakers, Jews as well as Christians, under the umbrella of Reformed Christianity, both standing united against the Pope and the Papal institution. So yeah, he wanted people to, yeah, he wanted to swell his ranks and hopefully make a little bit of money and have that support. But of course, he did get money and support from the Ottoman Muslims. So, but we shouldn't mention that because cause that would be, that would be anti-Lutheric or something, and slander against Luther. Yeah. So, showing an unhostile approach towards Jews, even temporarily, was another face of Luther's rebellion against the Pope. So, Augustinian monk. The church father, Augustine of Hippo, asked not to persecute the Jews, but rather to let them survive, but not flourish. He urged his Christian fellows that whether the Jews receive these divine testimonies with joy or with indignation, nevertheless, when we can, let us proclaim, proclaim them with great love for the Jews. That's a slightly different view to Martin Luther. Nevertheless, okay, Martin Luther never achieved the goal of converting the Jews. 
his formation de deepened, okay, his formation deepened even more the separation between the newly reformed Christians and those who chose to stay loyal to the Pope in Rome, such as in Austria, Bavaria, and the Rhineland. Furthermore, the Thirty Years' War, 1618 to 1648, and its horrible suffering, and approximately 4.5 to 8 million deaths, was one of the outcomes of the conflict between Protestants and Catholics. If you look at my Martin Luther, the first Protestant episode, I speak about how Martin Luther, how this was a mystical military movement. It was a it was a violent form of mysticism, a mystical militaristic movement that eventually encouraged war. That was like a form of Protestant jihad. And it wiped out up to 75% of the population of Germany at that point. And also it increased over the next century, warfare in Europe doubled because Martin Luther for the win. So <clears throat> this was one of the outcomes of the conflict between Protestants and Catholics. Also, Luther's attitudes towards Jews deepened the separation between the Jews and Christians more than it was before. So Martin, Martin Luther was winning here. I mean, he improved things because the Catholics are bad. So Martin Luther definitely was, was doing a great, great job, Martin. Well done. Well done. Okay. Did Luther wish to have the Jews on his side for economic reasons? Hoping that, hoping that Jewish finance would fuel the engines of his reformation and it would be expanded much faster and wider. Yeah, definitely no agenda there at all. Definitely not. So, as a former Augustinian monk, Luther may have been influenced by Augustine's position amongst about Jews. However, in contrast to Augustine's unlimited and unconditional position, Luther limited his positive views towards Jews for a certain amount of time and under a definite condition. Now, Luther says here, I am not a Hebraist with respect to grammar, nor do I wish to be one. And then Martin Luther says, I cannot stand being tied down to rules. I would rather translate the Bible freely, for even if one has a talent for languages, he cannot fully reproduce the meaning from one language to another. Accurate interpretation is a special gift of God. That's a little Muslim to me, but okay. But doesn't that tie in with, uh, I acknowledge no fixed rules for the interpretation of the word of God. I would rather translate the Bible freely yeah, you know, like, you know, yeah, yeah, yeah. It's like, like, um, thou shalt not steal. It's like, I'm going to change that. I'm going to steal. Thou shalt only steal a little bit. How's that? You know, thou shalt only steal a little bit. So that, for instance, like in California, if you steal less than $970, you, it's a misdemeanor and you don't go to jail. So thou shalt only steal a little bit. Okay, so there you go. There, there you go. That's Martin Luther's New Ten Commandments. Sounds great. Seems like that might result in a lot of denominations. Erwin, yes, that you get it. That was brilliantly said. Let me just bring that up. <clears throat> Sorry, guys. I've <clears throat> my cold. My 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 ears are blocked. My nose is blocked. My throat is stuffed. Seems like that might result in a lot of denominations. Yeah, yeah. I get that feeling too. I get that feeling. Like the devil, just lying a little bit. Yeah, that slippery slope, right? That slippery, slippery slope. Yeah, you can only Protestant in Arabic, <laughs> says Dino Dennis. You can only Protestant in Arabic. <laughs> yes, yes, yes. Yeah, so the, these odd little parallels, these ideas, these consistencies across, it's just so weird. It's just so weird. Luther sounds like Judge Dredd. I am the law. Yeah, and... Yeah, yeah, I can only speak a little bit of Arabic. Like, yeah, for instance, I mean, I I would move to Germany, but I don't speak Turkish. <laughs> okay, yeah, moving on. Okay, <clears throat> so Luther's Judeophobia. Now, now we get to Martin Luther's nasty bits, right? As a reformer, Luther intensified his attack on Jews in a frequent, consistent, and very hateful manner. The more harshly the longer he lived, the more harshly he voiced poisoned assertions against the Jews and their religion and culture. He acted openly against the Jews by all means, whenever and wherever he could. This approach is evidence, evident in his letters, his, his hadiths, his sermons, his theological texts, and his commentaries. 
It peaked in his final years, particularly in 1543, when he published three racist, anti-Semitic manifestos. From Shem Hamforas. We'll discuss that in a little bit. I will mention about from Shem Hamforas. And then, we just change this a little bit, just make it slightly smaller. Von den Juden und ihren Lügen, from the, about the Jews or about the Jews and their lies, and von den letzten Worten Davids, the last words of King David. In the latter, that's the words of King David, the last words of King David, in the latter, Luther directs the nastiest epithets and accusations against the Jewish people and their beliefs, including detailed practical guidelines about how to diminish the Jews and their religion and culture from society violently, even about how to deny their presence in the German territories. Hang on, who does that remind us of? Who does that remind us of? I just, man, there's, an, there's a name. It's on my lips. It's on my lips. Oh my golly. Oh my golly. There's a, there's a name that a guy that wanted to violently deny the presence of Jews in German territories. Oh man, it's on my lip. I, gee whiz, it's definitely on my lips. Um, mm, I don't know, man. Can, can anyone tell me? Anyone tell me? There's, there's a guy. I, oh, good grief. Definitely. Yeah. That guy. That guy. <clears throat> yeah, that's definitely Hitler. So, yeah, there's a little bit of uh, overlap there. Okay. And guys, of course, I have to do standard YouTube things. Thank you for, for uh, you know, being here for 109 of you. That's amazing. Thank you very, very much. And uh, great to have this conversation with you and um, for having the, the chat. And also, yeah, the, the, the fact that you guys are active in the chat. Actually, I'm on top chat. I need to go all chat live. And um, yeah, if you do enjoy the content, I know that I tend to use what's called the historical sarcastic method. It's not exactly the historical scientific method, but I think that my details and I think that my references are sound, that I provide all my sources. And I think that I, I my conclusions are based on, on good evidence. I'm not just making things up. Um, below my nose. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, so yeah, hopefully... Hopefully that if you like this, you will share it, you'll subscribe, and you will, of course, also hit that like button. Um, and uh, yeah, and again, always thank you guys for the support that I've had. I was able to spend something like $380 to buy 58 volumes. It's no longer just 55. There's now 58 volumes of Luther's works in English. Actually, let me just go there so you can see it. I'm now, it's, I've had it for a couple of, a few months now, and it's, it's very difficult. The software is hard to work with, I must admit. The Logos Bible software is very hard to work with, um, but at least there are 63, I've got 63 Luther books, so the 58 of Luther's works plus additional that I've managed to get hold of. I've bought a few and there's other references that I've managed to acquire. <clears throat> so there's a lot of Luther stuff and um, actually, hold on, let's just look up under the papacy. Let's just look this up. Like for instance, when you look at under the papacy, you'll find here 63 books with, with Luther, 205 results in 189 articles in 39 resources. The man hated the Catholics. He absolutely hated the Pope. And it's like, let's be all ecumenical and love one another. No, no, no. He was hate those people. Let's go make war on them. But anyway, so the software is very hard to get used to. It's taken me a long time to actually start to understand. And, and one other problem I've got with this particular um, version of, of Luther's translations, this American <clears throat> translation of Luther's works, it is very different to other previous English translations. It's very difficult to sometimes for me to make the translation from German to English because the the, the obvious translation isn't always the, the one that they chose. So sometimes I'll find references to things and I want to see if these are authentic. And I struggle to find them in this version of Logos because the search function is really hard to use. It is incredibly hard. And I said also the language, I, I half suspect that they've deliberately change the language to make it hard to find the, the bad things or they've made it hard or they've sometimes just not included some of the bad things. I get this feeling sometimes. Even though I'm using the broadest possible search, it seems to make no difference. And, you know, it's it's really tough to, to work with this, but I'm slowly actually getting the hang of it. And despite the difficulties, I'm actually starting to find a lot of gems in Martin Luther's works. Wow, thank you, Mariusz Moisa. Thank you very much. Welcome to Tier 3 Scout. Thank you for joining up. Thank you for signing up. Much appreciated. So guys, this was, 300, I think, $380 to buy or something like that. Um, you sponsored the majority of it, so I'm very grateful that I'm able to do this, and then I can back up these statements from Luther's own words. So 
Let's continue. In, his, in contrast to his statements in 1523 that Jesus Christ was born a Jew, where he blamed the Roman Catholic Church and the Christian society for the Jews' miserable situation, now Luther holds the Jews themselves responsible for their agony. James of Turds. <laughs> <laughs> Martin, thanks, Martin Ackerman. That that yeah, James of Turds. That's a good, good goods. It's just your boy, your boy Jay. Yeah, goods. Yeah, okay, fair point. Now Luther holds the Jews themselves responsible for their agony. He says they themselves are to be blamed for their persecution and expulsion. They should give the explanations why they were expelled fifteen hundred years. A people without a king, without law, without a prophet, and without a temple. They cannot name any other cause rather than their sins. So it's not about the Christians mistreated them. It's that the Jews are themselves to blame and they shouldn't blame anyone else. It's, in this case, blaming the victim. So yeah, very uncharitable at best. And also notice what Luther said on Monday, he contradicted on Tuesday. We have a certain guy called Mohammed that has the very same problem in his religious texts and writings. So by their sins, Luther probably hints at the Jewish rejection of Christ and Christianity. Indeed, in a table talk, sorry, a hadith from the, night, from the 1530s, Luther states that most of the Jews have blasphemed God and strangled the pious prophets. So the dear forefathers and patriarchs had blasphemers in their houses. Luther now talks differently regarding the Jews and their conversion. Whenever I find another good Jew to baptize, I will drag him up the bridge by hand, hang a stone on his neck, and throw him into the Elbe. That's the Elbe River. Let's have a look here. Wenn ich mehr ein frommen Juden wird finden zu zu taufen. Sorry. <clears throat> Come on. Oh, what the heck just happened? Oh, great. Sorry, something. Uh, I made a wrong mistake here somehow. Let's see if I can undo that. Wenn ich mehr einen frommen Juden wird, finden zu taufen, will ich ihn zur Hand auf die Brücke führen, einen Stein an den Hals hängen und in die Elbe werfen. So I will hang a stone around their neck and throw the Jew in the river Elbe. If I find another Jew to baptize, because he, because the Jews basically he apparently converted a Jew who then, and then then you know left Christianity, and he's saying, well, if that happens again, I will make sure that I will. I will take this Jew and drown him in the river because 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 Martin Luther was the good guy. Okay, um, so that that is from Luther's works. You can see that's the old Gothic script. Okay, let's consider again. Martinus Lutero's did say but now notice there's a lot of the stuff in Latin. Another thing I've discovered is some of the worst or some there's a great deal of Martin Luther's materials still in the original Latin, untranslated or partly translated. There's also a lot of it still in Gothic German, old 16th century Gothic script. Very, very difficult to read, not translatable, okay, or not scannable. So, wenn ich einen frommen Juden, okay, er überkomme zu taufen, so, so will ich ihnen also halt nach der Taufe auf die Elbrücken führen und einen Stein an Hals hängen und ihn ins Wasser stürzen, push him into the water. So there you go. And they've got the German here, and they've got the... And they've got the, um, okay, I'm just going to just minimize this again. So they've got the German and they happen to have the Latin as well. Okay, let me just minimize that. So just so you can see that this is, this is coming from, from an original sort of Luther-like source, all right? Um, sorry. <clears throat> so I'm taking this from original old printings of Luther's works because Remember, I have been told many, many times that there's a lot of apocryphal stuff out there. You know, it's a lot of, lot of bad, you know, people are making up stories. Well, okay, look, man. Okay, what does this one say? Wenn ich mehr ein Juden tauf, so will ich, if when I baptize a Jew, okay, so will ich ihn auf die Elbrück führen, the river, the, the bridge on the river Elbe, Elbe, I'm going to take him to, ein Stein an Hals hängen und ihn abstoßen. Okay, so yeah, I guess what he's, whatever, he's saying nice things. So he says, here at Wittenberg, in our parish church, there's a sow carved into the stone, under which lie young pigs and Jews who are suckling. Behind the sow stands a rabbi who is lifting up the right leg of the sow, raising behind of the sow, 
bowing down and looking into the Talmud under the sow with grace, with great effort, as if he wanted, no doubt, to read and see something most difficult and exceptional. In other words, he's calling the pig's ass, he's calling the pig's anus, the Talmud. No doubt they gained their Shem Ham for us from that place. So no wonder, he says, the Jews retrieved the Shem Ham for us from the anus of a pig. And you've got a pig lying here with piglets and Jews lying there suckling from the pig. And this Jew is lifting up the pig's tail and staring into its anus to find the Shem Ham for us or the name of God. So the Shem Ham for us apparently is Yahweh. Y-H-W-H, the Tetragrammaton. So Shem Ham for us, also known as Shem Hameforash, is a term that originates from Tanaitic literature and refers to the Tetragrammaton, the four-letter name of God in Hebrew. So the name Yahweh, as Martin Luther is expressing it here, is something that the Jews pulled out the ass of a pig. Make of that what you will. So now he says here, see the Tischreden, okay? Um, and he says here, wenn ich mehr in frummen Juden wird finden zu taufen, will ich ihn zur Hand auf die Brücke führen, einen Stein an den Hals hängen und in die Elbe werfen. So, so the guy gives plenty of these references, and you've seen that these references are historical. They do exist. Okay, so this is not me just making up stories. So Yahweh, yeah, <clears throat> Yahuwave, right, the original name of God that goes back three and a half thousand years, at least in inscriptions, um, all the way to Egypt, of all places, um, apparently is pulled out by the Jews from the anus of a pig. But that's that's Christian, okay? Remember, Martin Luther is the greatest theologian to ever live. Don't doubt it. The, the Catholics are bad, okay? Just remember, if ever you doubt Martin Luther, just tell yourself the Catholics are bad, the popes are evil, and and the Jews found the name of Yahweh in the anus of a pig. Just just tell yourself that, and, and you'll be fine. So, <clears throat> yeah, yeah. Excuse me, Protestant. His name is Mobrick Med because night. Yeah, okay. So, yeah, yeah, yeah. So, hold on. I would rather ask Luther to throw me in the sea. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Okay. So, salvation is of the Jews. Yes, bulletproof monk. I was a member, but my card got renewed. So, I had to renew all my membership as well. So, thank you, Marius Moisa. Thank you very much. Okay. Let me continue. <clears throat> Sorry, I might have to stop because my, my throat is killing me. <clears throat> yes, Conithiendo, that is disgusting. But that is also Martin Luther, and Martin Luther is disgusting. So, <clears throat> so question. I mean, you're the audience, and I'd like you to be honest. Am I exaggerating? Am I making up facts? Am I cherry-picking? Am I dabbling in things randomly and being completely impartial and just trying to present a false picture? Or am I simply saying, look, we've seen the beautiful, lovely, sweet, standard Lutheran narrative. Here's the facts that the, the great scholars of history and the great Protestant theologians just somehow casually, accidentally forgot. Maybe I'm just filling in the blanks, filling in the side. But but look, seriously, am I... Welcome, Villainous. Good to see you. So yeah, am I am I I'm just making things up? You know? Or am I, am I presenting another side of the story that allows you to make... A better determination because you're I'm being evil phobic <laughs> yeah because I hopefully I'm just providing facts and the details that were left out that dishonest scholars partial scholars partial dishonest theologians priests have left out because it would destroy the Protestant narrative so in von den Juden und ihren Lügen in the Jews and their lies Luther once again demonizes the Jews by describing them as devils okay that's the picture remember this is still there, and the, and the, the Germans refuse to take it down. <clears throat> he accuses them of still considering the messianic prophecies of the Old Testament unfulfilled, of failing to recognize the real Messiah Jesus, and of murdering him. So now he becomes exactly like those nasty, evil Catholics. In fact, he goes even further. He goes well beyond that, because the Catholics are bad. Remember, when in doubt, Martin Luther is the greatest theologian to ever live, he rescued the Bible from the clutches of the evil Catholic Church. In fact, he found the Bible after the Catholic Church had hidden it for hundreds of years. He discovered the true original Christian religion, which says that the name of Yahweh comes out of the anus of a pig, and he fixed Christianity. Just remember, just tell yourself that. And just, just 
That's the that's my story, and I'm sticking to it. These false and unknown Jews or Israelites who have wrought no miracle in these 1,500 years, who have interpreted no writings of the prophets. Okay, fine. I don't know what Paul was. Was was Paul a Jew? I can't remember. Was was Paul Jewish? Good grief. I have no idea. I I don't know. I can't remember if Paul was Jew or not, but maybe Paul was Buddhist because I I half suspect he was interpreting writings of the prophet. (laughs) So, and these Jews who have perverted everything, who have done nothing in the open, but underhandedly and clandestinely, like children of darkness, that is, of the devil, have practiced nothing but blasphemy, cursing, murder, and lies against the true Jews in Israel, who are the Christians. They are not Israel's or Abraham's seed, but venomous and devilish foes of the true Israel and Abraham's children. They are despoilers, they are robbers and perverters of the Holy Scripture. So look, you know what, I can see why Muslims tell us that the the Holy Scriptures, the, the Old Testament, or the Hebrew Bible, has been altered. It's false because because as Muhammad tells us here, the Jews have altered the Bible. Sorry, as Martin Luther says here, the Jews have altered the Bible. As Muhammad has said here, the Jews have altered the Bible. As Martin Luther has said here, the Jews have... Is this the same thing? Like seriously, I feel like I'm in a loop here. I feel like I'm... Like, is this Muhammad Luther? Am I... Am I mistaking something here? Am I am I exaggerating this? Am I getting this wrong? <clears throat> so, Palestinians, Lloyd, come on, catch up with the time. Sorry about that. You're right. <clears throat> Roxy says, same spirit. And welcome, Dr. Obvious. Good to see you. Yep. Yeah, so, okay, guys, I'm at page 17. My throat is really stuffed. So I'm going to try and do this in two parts, but let me go a little bit more. In his final letters to his wife, Katharina von Bora, the Lutherine on the latrine, <laughs> bad joke, Luther holds the Jews responsible for his illness and dizziness because he passed by their residential area in a village near Eisleben. Accordingly, he planned to expel all the Jews from that area. Yeah, I once walked past an area, there were some Chinese people and I felt a bit dizzy, so I said to the government, you know, you got to throw all these people out, burn down their houses. <clears throat> because, and, I, and they asked me why, and I said, that's the Christian thing to do. And they said, you're right, you're right. That's what Martin Luther would do. Because as good Christians, we have to ask ourselves, what would Martin Luther do? And this is, of course, where people like like Anthony Rogers and others have said, well, you know, <clears throat> hold on, hold on, hold on. Martin Luther is not our rule of faith. It is the Bible. And Martin Luther is only the founder of our religion. He only founded the five solas. We only follow Martin Luther's tradition of interpreting the Bible but Martin Luther, we don't follow Martin Luther. We follow the Bible. And Martin Luther followed the Bible just like Martin Luther followed. And we follow the Bible like Martin Luther told us to follow it. And we don't follow Martin Luther. And and we don't follow Martin Luther. We follow the Bible. And the Bible says that if you feel dizzy when walking past the area with Jews, burn their houses down and throw them out. Because that's what Jesus would, sorry, that's what Martin Luther would do. So anyway, as I said, I, I'm, I'm utilizing here what is known as the, the historical sarcastic method because because this man is ridiculous. Honestly, Martin Luther is ridiculous. So yeah, they don't follow Martin Luther. It's got nothing. Martin Luther has nothing to do with Protestantism, guys. Nothing. So, and he says, I have been weak on my way near Eisleben, which was my fault. But if you, Katharina, had been here, you would have said it was the Jews or their God's fault. It was the Jews or their God's fault. So the Jewish God potentially made Martin Luther ill. The Jewish God. So this is obviously the the Yahweh, right? The Yahovahveh, the Yahweh, the name of God that the Jews pulled out of a pig's ass. So that God called Yahweh made Martin Luther sick. Am I reading this wrong? Am Am I drawing a false, flawed conclusion here am i drawing a false conclusion please have i taken crazy pills and am i just making up crazy stuff yeah demi urge do you know yeah yeah well, one gets gnostic vibes don't you just you get some seriously heavy gnostic vibes from this so yeah let's let's have a look here uh, <clears throat> let's have a look at this Uh, let's have a look at this, and I've shown you guys this before, and I know we keep doing it all the time, but hopefully at some point 
it'll it'll just kind of become obvious. But but notice, remember, we've discussed this already in the past. This is not the only time. Remember, he says here, in some, okay, so when, for instance, he wrote to his friend Georg Spalatin during his stay at the Wartburg, by turns asking Georg to send him laxatives and entrusting him with his many manuscripts, or when in some of his very last letters to his wife, he described his inability to be sexually aroused by the sight of prostitutes, and he blamed Jews for his illness. He blamed Jews for his illness because he couldn't get turned on by prostitutes. So, so according to this, and we'll cover this in the future, I'll get to more notes on this, I'll add detailed. So yeah, it looks like he had this thing about blaming Jews. And uh, don't forget, Muhammad also blamed Jews because Muhammad had a time where the Jews bewitched him. And Martin Luther talks about the Jews bewitching people, right? The Jews casting spells with their magics. We've just mentioned some of that. And they, they bewitched Muhammad, who thought he was seeing his wives and sleeping with his wives, but he wasn't. The Jews did it to him. And here's Martin Luther going, yeah, the Jews did it to me too. So I'm, there's nothing to do with Islam. The Jews constipated him. Yes, there's, there's, sadly, sadly, that's, that, that's what they do. <clears throat> and then, of course, we've mentioned here, I mean, this I just don't get enough of this, but this is in PubMed, the NIH National Library of Medicine, Medicine National Center for Biotechnology Information. Let's just have a quick look here. Since the second half of his 30s, he was suffering from severe constipation, causing hemorrhoids, and anal prolapse. Okay, what is anal prolapse? That's when, so, it's something that does happen to, to gay people, that this is when the little tight little thingy that keeps the poop on the inside doesn't stay tight and it opens up because it's it's been used a little too much. It's had things pushed in there and it's kind of, it doesn't, it doesn't go tight anymore and then all the it, it's not good because then you you need a you need an adult diaper. So gay people get this; they get anal prolapse from having anal sex because then the 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 anus can't close properly; it stays open. So Martin Luther apparently had anal prolapse, and and I have to ask, how, why, if this report, this medical report, is true, I am gonna have to ask. How did this happen? <clears throat> so, yeah, look, we're adults here, man. This is Martin Luther. Oh, forceful straining can cause anal prolapse as well. Too much constipation. Well, he definitely had that problem. Okay, so let's move on. <clears throat> so, yeah. So anyway, he goes, I must start to expel the Jews so, because that's because Martin Luther, as you know, is better than those evil Catholics. So, therefore, Martin Luther must expel the Jews. And I think that hell and the whole world must be free of all devils. So, and also, this note about Katharina, where, that he tells his wife about it, this could imply that Katharina von Bora was even more anti Jewish than her husband. Okay? Or she was at least sympathetic to his views about Jews. So, he says here, so. I must, the whole world must be free of all devils who could perhaps come all here to Eisleben on my account. Okay, so are there also Jews here, about 50 in one house, as I wrote to you before. So Luther gave his very last sermon on, on February 15, 1546, that is just two or three days before his death. Here he describes Jews as Christians' enemies, accuses them of defaming and mocking the core saints of Christianity. And he attributes to Jews a homicidal character. The Jews are our public enemies. They never stop defaming our Lord Christ, calling the Virgin Mary a whore, and Jesus Christ the son of a whore. If they could, the Jews would gladly kill us all. Of course, he then goes on to say, apparently based on a hadith of his, that he says, just before his death, two or three days before his death, he says, we should have killed them all. Right? Martin Luther states, we should have killed all the Jews. So, of course, a guy called Hitler comes along and goes, no worry, Martin, I'll, I'll, I'll finish what you started. <clears throat> lovely man, lovely man, great man. This is, this is, guys, this is Christianity. Remember, this is Christian. Okay? And I'm indulging as, as Javier Perdomo will say, I'm engaging in, he has this thing called Luther slander. Because this is what happens when you read Muhammad's hadiths and you read the violence in the Quran and you actually just point it out, that's called Luther slander. When you read the Quran and you read the hadiths 
of Muhammad and you show them to Muslims and you show them the Sharia of Muhammad, they go, that's slander. So yeah, this is apparently, so he's got this little hashtag thing going, Muhammad slander, sorry, Luther slander. Names are so similar, it's hard to tell the difference. So in this sermon, Luther attempts once again to promote his mission to convert the Jews. Okay, so we wish to practice Christian love, but they want to murder us, you know, so, so, so really we, we should, you know. So yeah, we will not tolerate nor suffer that the Jews should be in our midst. Midst, sorry. Yeah. So then let's let's go, let's go on. So this the next portion is called a socio-religious explanation. So I will end soon because my throat is killing me. Um. Yeah. Luther's opponents blamed him for becoming a Judeophile connected to Jews, even following some of the Jews' beliefs. Luther reacted to those accusations by turning against the Jews and showing an extreme animosity towards the Jews. Okay, so yeah, because he got called a Jew lover, he said, okay, well, fine, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna to be nasty now. So Luther attempted to remove the stain of Judeophilia from himself, and he came to use it as a socio-political instrument in order to have them on his side by inflaming the German Christians, many of whom were immersed with anti-Jewishness. So, yeah, yeah, <clears throat> so this whole anti-Jewish thing has been going around in Germany for a long time, and that's why there's a straight line from a guy called Martin Luther to a guy called Adolf Hitler. Okay, uh, let me see, yeah, but there were people who blamed him for being a bit Jewish, then he regretted and attempted to get himself out of suspicion. Right, so well, so anyway, I'm not, this is, you guys can download this and read it yourself, yourselves. Um... Okay, so let me see. Um, I will do a little bit more. Let me see, I'm on page 21. Yeah. So Luther expected the Jews not to just accept Jesus as the Messiah with all that that means, but simultaneously he expected the Jews to reject their entire traditional biblical interpretation and its cultural background. But his wishes were naive from the very beginning, since the conversion would have amounted to religious and cultural suicide, technically a genocide. Now, everyone thinks a genocide is when you kill. No, no, a genocide is actually when you destroy the culture, you destroy the language, you get rid of the statues, like it's happening in America today, like it's happening in Europe today. You destroy the history. That's a genocide. Democide is when you kill them. Genocide is when you destroy the culture. Okay? And this effectively would have been a genocide of the Jewish culture. So understand that is the concern for the Jews. This is a this is an existential threat. So this has this is why this is not a simple issue to solve. So there are many Protestants acting as Abduls with you. Is it weird? I mean, don't Christians have to act as good men of God and defend the truth? Yeah, but this is Christianity infected with a little bit of uh, a lot of Luther and a little bit of uh, and too much Gnosticism. But let's put it that way. So uh, guys, I will do I think one or two one more page. I'll finish page twenty two, and my my throat is killing me. So I'll go to 23, and then we'll call it night. So they preferred to stay on the side of their protector. The Jews preferred to stay on the side of their protector, Kaiser Karl V, who was and continued to be with the Roman Catholic Church. So the evil Roman Catholic Church was protecting those evil Jews. Disgusting. No wonder Luther hated the church. I can see that. The Jews' rightful refusal of a collective conversion, that is, cultural suicide, is not a reason to destroy them and their heritage by any means spiritually as well as physically. In fact, why should the Jews, this is the author asking, why should the Jews give up their own ancient and very rich religious, cultural, and spiritual tradition for whose preservation they have paid an enormously substantial price over centuries? Now, how could it happen that the towering scholar, this great scholar with anal prolapse and prolific theologian, who is usually regarded among Protestants as one of the greatest religious thinkers and leaders since Jesus Christ could write such hateful and violent manifestos, not one or two, but three of them, and a whole bunch of hundreds of other articles against the homeless and politically powerless Jews while disrespecting one of the central theological principles of his own religion, that is, love thy enemy. Okay, pray for your enemies, right? So, so here he goes and he talks about how scholars obviously trying to make excuses or they're trying to, he was a man of his time, you know, it was normal to want to kill Jews back then. It's, it's different today. It could change tomorrow. So, you know, it's, there's no timeless principles in Christianity. There's just, 
Christianity and like we we don't steal today because we think that's great, but that was so two thousand years ago. Like you know, you know. Okay, so Luther spread anti-Semitism when he was already an old, weak, and sick man. That's one of the excuses. Well, you know, he he was sick and old, and he was got you got crotchety, so he started to be nasty. You know, get off my lawn, like an old man, right? However, Luther's statements cannot be excused by this weak ap- apologetic argument. In 1524 to 25, Luther was neither old nor sick or weak when he made similar remarks about the poor German peasants who revolted against the oppression of the princes. Now, I have discussed this in the, recently, right? I discussed how the princes complained to Martin Luther, complained about the princes to Martin Luther. They were oppressed, and Martin Luther wrote scathingly about the princes. He called them he called them nasty people who oppress their peasants, right? And so the peasants rose up in a revolt. So Martin Luther betrayed them, sided with the peasants, and of course he wrote that the peasants should be killed and that those who killed the peasants would go to paradise if they died. Sorry, would, would, would inherit heaven and blessings from God if they murdered the peasants and all who could should get a sword and murder the peasants. And on top of that, Martin Luther stated... Those who chop those peasants' heads off and arms off and stab them and slay them, that is not your hand that is doing it. It is God's hand that is doing it. It is God working through you to chop off those heads and murder those peasants. It is God, not you, because you are doing God's work. And you will earn righteousness and paradise from Allah if you do this. I've covered this before. I will be covering this again. It is the peasants' fault, though. Yes, it is the peasants' fault. They should have... They should have not gone against the, the leadership, granted, and they deserve to die. Martin Luther said so, and I'm I'm Luther for the win. Daniel the Iturbi, this guy was a disgusting pig. Yes, I've been saying that for years, and people don't believe me. <clears throat> so Martin Luther writes here, let the so right, let the spirits collide. We will suffer and watch that you fight with words, but keep the fists still. Okay, let your spirits collide, so use argument and so on. But then in 1525, he urged the opposite. When the peasants demanded that the princes offer them a reduction of taxes and housing rent, fishing privileges and the like, Luther, who was supposedly himself the son of a peasant, and that's a little questionable, but okay, he neither supported the demands of this oppressed society nor begged for a peaceful compromise. Under the guise of supporting law and order in a heavy-handed ruler, Luther firmly stood behind the aggressive princes and urged them to crush the peasants' rebellion ruthlessly, ignoring the peasants' just demands as if this was the only way to handle the crisis. He described the peasants as follows. A great fire that burns and consumes the land. They should be smitten, destroyed and stabbed secretly or openly. Right? Take them to Guantanamo and kill them there, right? wherever possible, remembering that nothing can be more poisonous, harmful, or devilish than a rebel. A rebel it is just as a mad dog that must be killed. If you would not attack and kill the rebel first, he will attack you and the whole country with you. On May 14 to 15, 1525, the Thuringian peasants' army was destroyed in the battle near Frankenhausen, and about 6,000 peasants were slaughtered by their oppressors. During the Peasants' Revolt, altogether about 100,000 farmers were killed in the German territories. In May 1525, Luther, aged 42, in good health, apparently, and without experience of any kind of personal trauma or tragedy, but rather the opposite. On July 13 of that year, he married Katharina von Bora. Still, in contrast to Thomas Munzer, Luther played the shrewd politician and took the side of the strong party, the German princes, rather than the side of justice, morality, and humanity, or what Martin Luther called Christian charity that the peasants were entitled to. Because, well, he did say to kill the peasants because God wants you to. Because this is an act of love. It's cleansing the world of evil dogs. So, which I believe Jesus said, kill the peasants if they, if they, if they argue about heavy taxes and oppression. Because that's what God wants you to do. I believe that's in that. There's a there's a book in the Bible with the whale, and I think Jesus says something there in the in the book of the whale. Let me know if I'm wrong. But this is where Martin Luther apologists will come in and say, well, you know, you know, but Martin Luther is not our example. You know, Martin Luther, we follow the Bible. We follow the Bible. So yeah, I, whatever. <clears throat> so yeah, so 
yeah, Martin Luther was making lots of, saying lots of nasty things because he was a good Christian, the best Christian to ever live. And remember, if these problems ever plague you, if you start to have problems thinking that Martin Luther might have been a disgusting pig of a man, remember, the Pope is bad. The Pope is evil. The Pope is the whore of Babylon and the Antichrist. And just sit down and have a beer and, you know. Yeah, so let's move on here. Let me just check. I actually learned from Lloyd because I hadn't any knowledge about Luther or Calvin. Thank you, Light for All Nations. Yeah. Um, John, Dr. Jonathan Gemmel says, I don't understand why some Christians thinks it's, think it's okay to hate Jews or any other race. Love your enemies indeed. Well, because Martin Luther taught them that this is Christian. Martin Luther literally said this, and you'll notice from what I'm reading here is that Martin Luther's followers repeat him verbatim. They're repeating his, his spirit lives on in them. Light for all nations, thank you. Good to see you. I hope whoever listens from Protestants' brothers acknowledge the facts that the brother is sharing and not just attack him falsely. The brother is reading the history. Yes, thank you very much. Fake human says, Woe to you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites, for you clean the outside of the cup and the plate, but inside they're full of greed and self-indulgence. Matthew 23, 25. So, fake human, what is your point? What is your point? Be specific. I have very little patience. I don't have a lot. Okay? I honestly don't have a lot. So, what is your point? What point are you trying to make? Does Jesus say, kill the peasants, kill the Jews? burn their houses, burn their books. Seriously, honestly, are you one of these um, murder the Jews Christians that follow Martin Luther? Let me know. <clears throat> okay, so let me see. So there are many. Okay, let me see. Okay, I think I've caught up with most of the comments. It's just your boy, Jay. We follow the Quran only. Yes, sola scriptura. We follow the Quran only. Sola scriptura. Okay, sola scriptura. We follow the Quran only. Yeah, sounds familiar. Doesn't sound familiar at all. Definitely nothing to do with Islam. Nothing. So, yeah. So, but we pick and choose and ask whatever against your Bible verse if you don't like it. But yeah, if we don't want it. Yeah, that's that. Let me see. The spirit of Luther is very much alive today, sadly. Yes, Dr. Jonathan Gemmel. And yeah. So, yeah. Okay, someone's mentioned that he could be a FARC member, FARC. So look, the communists. When you look at the inspiration for Luther, you're going to look at a guy called uh, Hus. Okay, so hold on. Let me let me actually get there. Let me actually do this. So guys, I'll end here for the night. I think this is good enough for now. Uh, let me just finish this one page, 453. I'll finish this and I'll show you one more thing and call it a night. Luther set up double standards. One for the forceful princes who oppressed the unfortunate German peasants and were entitled, according to Luther, to kill indiscriminately. Because Jesus said... When people rebel, kill them indiscriminately. That, that, that was the words of Jesus. And Martin Luther, being a fantastic, amazing theologian who fixed Christianity, who found and discovered the original Christian sources, who founded and discovered the original Christianity, took it out of the hands of those evil popes. And he discovered that Jesus said that you can kill indiscriminately if it's peasants, and you can probably do the same if it's Jews. Okay, So remember that that's, that was Luther. And it says here, that, and another, and he had another set of rules for the Jews who could be slaughtered, but had no right to fight to protect themselves. Yeah, that's the precedent, right? Because now they do the peasants, those bloody peasants. Like, good God, go kill them. So this is Jan Hus. Martin Luther said that he was a Hussite. He had a great deal of respect. And in fact, I was watching Dr. Gavin Ortland saying, you know, I, I've, I've shown this. I'm just such a fan of Jan Hus. Oh my God, I'm a fanboy. Oh! And, um, okay, great. So you go look at Jan Hus, and Jan Hus inspired a man called Benito Mussolini. Now, of course, here's where we're going to find all the excuses about, well, you know, actually, it's not like, sure, whatever. So, yeah, this is, this is here. He's a personal hero of mine. I just admire his courage. That's nice. So Benito Mussolini, the man who created fascism, um, was inspired by Jan Hus. Now, obviously, because he misread and misunderstood Jan Hus, because as you know, Jan Hus was a good guy. That's why Jan Hus inspired Martin Luther, who inspired Hitler, and also why Jan Hus inspired Mussolini, because there is nothing in Jan Hus's history that would remotely lead one to think that there's a direct line from Jan Hus to Karl Marx. Nothing at all. Nothing. And we will discuss this in the future, because we'll see that it's just me making up stories again. Yeah. You, know, you know how I make up stories. You guys are seeing me make up stories right here. So, yeah, so guys, I think what we can conclude from this discussion so far on Martin Luther is that Martin Luther was a wonderful man, a great theologian, 
a loving husband who cared about dogs, who would never say anything bad, who would never call for peasants to be murdered, who would never betray anyone. He was a great charitable Christian. And anyone who says anything else is just lying. And they probably got nasty, false information from Lloyd de Jong, who, who is just some random guy on YouTube who, who is falsely, falsely influencing people to believe lies and slander about Martin Luther. So, <clears throat> so the Germans were from the tribe of Reuben through his son named Kerman. They were from Kermanshah from Iran after the first. Okay, yeah, okay, fine. I have no idea about that. Um, Yeshua said, love thy neighbor. Pray for you. Don't forget, Yeshua, yeah, okay. He said, love thy neighbor, pray for your enemies, and don't pay evil with evil. Also them. <laughs> yeah, the Lutherans like, nah, nah, nah. That, that, that's old school religion. No, 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 no. Can't do that. Can't do that. There was Martin Luther, yeah, because Mar sola scriptura. Sola scriptura. Remember, Martin Luther, real Christian. That's what he did. So, so we've seen here the perfect example, the, the perfect example of Christianity. So guys, I um, hope you've learned something really useful. Oh, Brick Bass, good evening, you beautiful people. Lloyd, I made it. The kids are in bed and I'm listening at 1.8 speed. So great. I hope it's been interesting. So guys, my archives below. This paper is listed below along with the other one that I did just recently. So please give it a read. See if I'm just making it up or if this historian, this professor is making it up. It's... <coughs> <coughs> Sergeant Green says, truly outstanding episode, one of your finest. Thank you. Conatiendo says, thank you, Lloyd. I love learning about history. It's so bad. Many Latin Americans cannot understand English. Look, feel free to use AI these days and, uh, and uh, I can give you the transcripts in English if you want. And... Try to have it translated, you know, machine translation with DeepL into into your language, and we can figure out a way to. It's possible using Microsoft's ClipChamp to dub it into Spanish. Insano boy, <clears throat> so Insano bro says, I get that Protestantism is false, but is becoming Catholic really the solution? Well, let me see. So Martin Luther has been lying about the Catholic Church since day one, and uh, maybe you should not listen to the lies. Maybe maybe have a look and see if you've been lied to by people who were lied to, by people who were lied to, by people who had political um, agendas, who were lied to, who were given all of this information by a liar called Martin Luther. Ask yourself, is the Catholic Church, because which church do you belong to? Because, uh, look, that's another story. It's like, no, Lloyd, okay, fine, Lloyd, you've proven to me that Martin Luther is an absolute and utter pig, the most disgusting, file, vile, foul pig ever. You've proven that to me, but, you know, I like this particular lie of Martin Luther. I don't want to let go of it because I'm really comfortable with this particular lie. You know, I, I just really want to hang on to it if you don't mind, Lloyd. Okay, fine, whatever, man. Knock yourself out. <clears throat> uh, so it's just your boy Jay says, for me, his teaching about the history is so good, but no church is perfect. But you should still be discipled for we should be around people. Well, the church is made up of humans. Humans are not perfect. No human institution is going to be perfect. There is always going to be a problem in the church. If you go to the Bible called the New Testament, and St. Paul was writing a bunch of letters to a bunch of churches that was out of line, that were guilty of going off the rails. It's been happening since Jesus died. It's pretty much since the day one Christians, quote unquote, have been doing stupid things. So it's like, well, you know, the Catholic Church has not been perfect. Well, Martin Luther, excuse my French, was fucking horrible. Okay, this man is disgusting. So I would say that, um, yeah, the alternative is a lot better than this guy. So thank you very, very much. Um, thank you. That's, a, that's Crusader General. I really am grateful. I do appreciate it. He says, slightly off topic. Apparently Putin didn't build enough mosques in Russia. Yeah, and he needs to, he needs to tear them all down at this point. I don't know. Well, I mean... Well, the thing is, these are citizens, so, but I don't think he should build anymore. I think he needs to start, he needs to train a lot of Eastern Orthodox, Russian Orthodox missionaries, and he needs to send them to convert as many Muslims as possible to Christianity, because anything's better than Islam at this point, okay? So... Melita Manini says, or Manin, sorry, Melita Manin says, 500 years of anti-Catholic propaganda. There's bound to be some cognitive dissonance. Of course. Of course. So guys, <clears throat> in Saint says, so people who claim they hear God's voice and everything they do is backed up by the Bible is the same as Protestantism. Yes, it's mysticism. It is mysticism. 
but it's, it's an unhinged because Martin Luther was a nominalist. And this is something we will discuss again in the future, but it's completely unhinged philosophy. So it is Martin Luther's whole idea of Sola Scriptura is based on the utterly unhinged philosophy of nominalism. So, so <clears throat> these people I watched also call themselves non-denominational. Yeah. So fake human, offspring of vipers. Okay, you know what? Uh, you are done here. Thanks, fake human. Have a wonderful day further. Say goodbye to the camera. Okay. You can now go away and, I don't know, bother someone else. And, um, you know, I feel really bad banning you, but, you know, I'm, I'm going to sit here later and I'm going to think, you know, am I going to have some ice cream or take a nap or order a burger? Because I'm, I'm going to feel really bad and I won't know whether to kill myself or make some coffee, maybe a cup of tea. Tough life, tough choices. Okay, <clears throat> so moving on. Owen Charlton says, I'm currently drinking from the fire hose of becoming Catholic, so much deeper than what I grew up with. Look, you've been lied to. When I get into the story of the, well, once I get eventually, eventually one fine century, when I get to the, the, um, the Black Legend, the Spanish Inquisition, you're going to see the whole anti-Catholic propaganda, the lies that you've been told, the outright fabricated, deliberately created propaganda and lies by Protestants, the, the whole program they put together, they, they went out of their way to tell lies because because they're the good guys, they're Christians. So guys, I've said this already, so um, I'm, yeah, so Tigger says, unraveling the lies through centuries takes time and dedication. Thank you. So guys, hopefully what I'm saying here is believable. Hopefully it is credible. Hopefully you have the facts, okay? Um, hopefully you have decent, credible information that I'm presenting. I am not just making things up. Look, my throat, I'm going to die. So guys, um, I'm not doing my throat any favor. So everyone, thank you very much. Thank you again for the donation. I'm so grateful. Thank you. <clears throat> um, so guys, thank you for supporting the channel. For those who like what I do, please like, do share, do subscribe. And uh, again, thank you all for all the support. Um, I could not have done all of this without your help. You've been able to allow me to, to buy all of these things, to spend a ton of money, to, to get things that I need. And uh, everyone, I will see you tomorrow. I'll probably be on with Thunderous. Um, and uh, everyone, I'll also then Monday, I will not be available because I have something happening on Mondays now. So I'll switch to Wednesdays and Tuesdays. And uh, Sherry Brogdon, I'm so grateful that I could convert to Catholic from Protestant. Yeah, I'm, look, I mean, I'm also looking into that now because, look, as imperfect as the Catholic Church might be, right, the, the, the doctrine is consistent. The history is clear. And Protestantism is just, as far as I can tell, to a large degree, founded on lies from top to bottom. Um, so guys, yeah, thank you all very much and have a wonderful day further.